I'd like to introduce Tara McSell. She's the author of Collateral Damage. She's a colleague of mine, from, also from Colorado. She's on the dirty side of the mountain where they've drilled extensively. And she'll relate to her, her stories and the colleagues that she knew that have been personally affected by the industry. Hello. Um, some of this sounds, um, unfortunately, kind of like doom and gloom, and um, but there's a positive side to it, and I think that's what has motivated uh, Jeff and Jody and Drysick to reach out and organize the event they've organized for this weekend, a mass rally to bring attention. I think that 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 type of showing of numbers is going to be important. We're seeing it. I mean, we see all of us were spending the week very closely together, literally, in compact cars, driving every night, and we're sharing information, what we get from our networks. And, you know, there are pretty large numbers coming in from other areas of the world where people are standing up and protesting um, specific things. Montreal just had a very large protest, 3,000 France banned fracking. I mean, I don't know how to make a horror story sound good, but the positive side of this is people are beginning to pay attention. And we have come here at the request of these wonderful folks to try to prevent the similar things continuing to happen under the radar. Um, my analogy, I feel like the industry is the big guy on the bottom of the seesaw on the playground. He's got all the weight. And the little kid is on the top. And the industry just keeps bouncing that little kid off. Because they can. They have the power. But at what point in time have enough little kids been flipped off the top of that seesaw? And when I hear the news that people are rising up in larger groups to to say, you know, we've got some issues. We're not going to put up with this this way. Um, anyways, I just preface it that way to say there's a positive reason behind us coming here and saying the hard things that you have to listen to. So much for notes. <laughs> I live in Garfield County. I'm a landowner. I've lived there for 10 years. Um, my husband and I own a small piece of property, 28 acres. We're both, you know, work full time. And we thought this is where we were going to nicely get old together on a little bit of land. About five years after we moved there, we found out that we were living in what was going to be a huge boom, boom town of natural gas development. And I'm sure you folks have all heard the word, the Saudi Arabia of America. <laughs> Marcella Shale. Well, we were that then. Garfield County, the Saudi Arabia of America, the Piscean's Basin. And I just thought, what are we doing here? I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. And literally living in a boom, uh, you watch your community change before your eyes in a myriad of ways. It's a huge learning curve for a regular landowner to begin to say, what do I need to know about this industry? Maybe if you're living in the middle of town and it's not directly going to impact you, you don't think they're going to try to lease under you, maybe you're not quite as concerned as someone who has acreage where you think they might be coming to lease from you. But the reason I'm saying that is I began trying to get informed immediately as soon as I found out that gas and oil development was coming very close to where I lived. If you do get approached by a gas company, there are some very important basics that would be helpful for you to be aware of. And I won't go into the specifics. Gas and oil does get complicated very, very, very fast. And depending on your, individ your individual situation, it might be very different than a neighbor's. There's a lot of fine points, details, red tape, mineral rights, county laws, state laws, but I would advise you to not rush into anything. If a landman shows up at your house from a company, gives you a document, talks about the amounts of money you can make if you sign now, 
maybe says, you know, neighbors are going to be f- already pooled around you, but you can make money too. Hold, I, I would advise you to take a little time and maybe reach out to some of the folks who you think are knowledgeable, get a little info, maybe seek a little legal advice, and find out what would be the best thing to do before you jump in. I began getting involved a little more than the regular landowner to the extent where I felt it was necessary to help my fellow citizens learn some of the basics. We held very simple meetings in rooms just like this, pass out lists of phone numbers and tips, 10 bullet points, how to do a baseline water test, the appropriate ones, phone numbers to call, how to pool together with neighbors, just sharing information. After I started spending more quality time with these new friends of mine, these people, then we took the next step and began getting involved in supporting legislation that was legislation that would assist landowners in having a fair shake in um, some of the rules and regs that were going down in Colorado. Soon I knew quite a few people and some of the folks who began showing up at the state capitol or packing into SUVs with us for all day and driving back and forth to Denver, some of these people had some pretty problematic situations occurring from ruined water wells to health impacts and a myriad of other issues. And my interests suddenly began to shift toward not just saying, how do I get how do I get informed to best protect my husband and my you know, landowner rights, I began to say there seems to be a problem here um, when we're hearing about leaking pits and you know, workers coming home and telling family members they're concerned that things are being sprayed all over the fields and you know, pits that were full the night before were a quarter empty the next morning and people were getting ill. And I began taking note. Um, I'm going to tell you about a couple of the landowners who I know who had some pretty dramatic things happen. The first woman is Laura Amos. And if you saw the wonderful movie Split Estate, and if you didn't see it, you must see it, uh, Laura Amos was the impetus for that movie being created. Um, Her story was covered in NRDC On Earth magazine in a fabulous article called How Halliburton is Wrecking the Rockies. The producer of Split Estate came here, came to Colorado, and began covering the issue because that story spurred her to do so. The Amoses lived on a ranch, and one day their water well blew up, uh, pretty simultaneously with drilling and fracking operations on the gas well right by that property. Their water well did not just blow up all over the yard. Then the water was also heavily contaminated with methane. It was discolored, it stunk, and they were very concerned. The Amoses tried to get the state and the responsible company to step forward and assist them, but no proof seemed to be sticking um, to point the finger at the fact that the drilling and the fracking might have had something to do with their water going bad. They were told to leave their windows and closet doors open so their house didn't blow up. A couple years later, Laura then developed a rare tumor, um, an ad- a rare adrenal tumor, and she was very concerned. She had to rush in for surgery. Luckily, they took out her entire gland, and she was, you know, better. But she began researching her tumor and laboratory research that Dr. Theo Colborn had been involved in and done reports on linked that tumor to a chemical used in hydraulic fracturing we call it 2BE. It has a bigger, fancier name, which I'll let you guys figure out how to say correctly because I keep botching it. Laura then got in contact with Theo Colborn, and Theo Colborn, the eminent scientist, was deeply concerned. The water well blew up. Gas well was fracked right nearby. Water wells, from my point of view, probably yours, don't often just spontaneously blow up. But there was too many, too many red flags um, 
with the fracking of the well, the 2BE, the rare tumor in the blown up water well. And Laura fought, 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 and luckily had some enough help from people like Theo Colborn that finally, with the help of a very experienced lawyer, an out-of-court settlement was reached and enough pressure was put on the regulatory entities and the Incana Gas Company that, as Weston Wilson said, when big damages happened, a settlement was reached out of court and a non-disclosure agreement was signed, which means you cannot implicate the company for those damages once you take the money and sign the agreement. And it's a very handy deal because those stories quietly go away. The second person I'm going to tell you about is a woman named Elizabeth Mabaldi who lived in a nearby town near where Rick lives. And they lived on a small farm. Drilling had been going on for a number of years around the area and they had a well at the bottom of their driveway which was often flared in spectacular flares. You know, it looks like big fires going off. They had waste pits above their house and there was quite a bit of drilling activity in the area. And Chris began getting ill with some of the typical symptoms that people are reporting now from across the country in areas near drilling. Massive nosebleeds, waking up covered in blood, debilitating headaches, joint pains, hand pains, and, you know, dysfunction. I was her boss at that time. This was in 2002. And she... Uh, became too ill to work. She was finally diagnosed with a pituitary tumor, and she left work um, six months after I met her, had her head sawed open, had the tumor removed, and went downhill from there. At that point in time, they did not know really what was causing her illness, and we kind of faded out of touch. Several years later, I was on the phone with Laura Amos, talking about gas issues, and she said there was a hearing the other day, and a woman showed up named Elizabeth Mabaldi, who had a plethora of symptoms she thought was from the gas fields. It took me a minute to realize it was my coworker she was talking about. Chris had now abandoned her home, moved a couple hours west to get away from the environment, and now she had a syndrome called acquired foreign accent syndrome, where she spoke in roving foreign languages. She was also very emaciated and becoming rapidly becoming an invalid. We rehooked up because I was very involved in gas and oil, and at this point, Chris asked me to write a book about her experiences. I have written a book before, so I, I agreed to. The next day, Chris and her husband drove two hours to see me, and it was April. And they got out of their truck, and even though Chris was really sick, she was beaming, smiling, emaciated, but beaming. And Steve had a big box under his shirt, his T-shirt, and I thought they brought me a gift. I thought they maybe brought me a 12-pack of beer or something. And, and Chris said, Tara, this is for everything you have done for us. They handed me the box. And I opened it up, and it was a brown corrugated box, and it said Toshiba. They brought me a brand new laptop in 2005 for me to write her story. So for five years, every weekend, I wrote. And I produced a very fat book, which is back there, called Collateral Damage. Because of being involved with these landowners, I just kept meeting more people and continuing doing work on legislation. Next thing you know comes the media party. And movie makers suddenly find you and you get phone calls. There's a movie maker here, BBC World News, NBC, the local radio, people like the Andre Six, and people want you to take them on tours or line up interviews. Fortunately, I knew so many people so well, I knew their numbers by heart, I could race out of my office at work sit in the back of my truck and give them all the phone numbers to set up the interviews. And as Rick knows, we usually get, oh, five hours notice, maybe 12 hours. But um, that led to movies, Gaslands, Split Estate, the, the documentary, and, and finally the book. 
I guess the last thing I want to say, and this is sobering, um, these landowners, including the woman whose front yard is displayed on my book with the gas derrick engulfed in a 200-foot tower of flames when the condensate tank blew up, these people have lived through things that nobody should have to live through, and the health impacts are particularly egregious. Chris Mavaldi lost her fight this October. Um, I'm pleased to say I was able to go down and see her two days before she went in for her last brain surgery for another removal of the recurrent pituitary tumor, and she got to hold in her hands the book about what happened to her before she left us. She was thrilled. She was also almost totally blind by then. The woman looked like she had aged 20 years in about the period of a year after her symptoms really got bad. She just lived through a horrid, horrid time. The physician who had treated her publicly came forward after she passed away and said that her illnesses were caused by exposure to toxins from the gas fields. So I just want to tell you folks, you people in this room here are not the only people in rooms like this across the U.S. and it really, we really hope that the push keeps on going. Um, we need to share our information and we need to see that these things just don't get repeated over and over again. And for those of us out west, we're really hoping that you guys with your bigger populations near more urban areas will be able to, to stand up to it and make some changes for the better because it's been very difficult out west. So thank you. And